Welcome to the next installment of the Accessible Technology webinar series. Today we have Gaby DeYoung talking about accessible documents. Gaby? All right, thanks Anna Marie. Hopefully everyone can hear me and you can see uh, my title slide for my presentation today. Um, I'm going to be talking about accessible electronic documents. And as Anna Marie mentioned, my name is Gaby DeYoung, and I'm a member of the IT accessibility team, uh, where my focus is working with folks across campus on collaborating and creating um, accessible electronic or digital documents. Um, and this is our agenda for today. We're going to start off by talking about some principles of uh, electronic documents. Uh, what makes uh, electronic documents accessible, essentially. Um, and then I'll talk, I'll go into um, best practices and techniques for creating accessible Word documents and PowerPoint presentations. And I'll, um, I'll do some demonstration um, on those two applications. Um, and from there, we'll switch to talking about PDF and what makes a PDF uh, uh, document uh, accessible. And I'll show you an example of a, a tag tree, and I'll explain what a tag tree is a little bit later on. Um, and then I'll also talk about accessibility in InDesign and also in the Google Workspace. And I notice I have some question marks there. So we'll talk about um, utilizing the different tools that are available in the applications to create more accessible content and kind of const uh, contrast that to, to office applications. Um, and I'll talk about accessibility checkers that are built into Office and Adobe Acrobat Pro. Um, and then we'll review um, when to use certain formats over other formats. Um, so I also want to mention that um, a lot of the demonstrations, actually of the demonstrations that I'll be per performing today, will be using Office 365, the most current and up-to-date version of Office. Um, and I would implore you that if, you, or if, you're, um, if your department does not have, or if you do not have access or are not currently using um, Microsoft Office 365, to, um, to talk to your IT administrator and ask that they update you and potentially your entire department to Office 365. There really is no reason why anyone should be using older versions of Office. We, we have enterprise licenses uh, for the most current version. And if you're using older versions of Office, um, it may be uh, some of the, um, some of the um, uh, the, the tools that I'm going to show you might not be in the same place. Some of the steps might be a little bit different and some options might not even be available at all. Um, so it, it really is more advantageous to you as a, a document author to make sure that you're using the most current version. And we do have access to, to that on campus. So um, it, there really is no excuse to be using older versions. So just something I also wanted to bring up as well. Okay, principles of uh, accessible documents. So many standards of accessibility relate to content styling and layout and for document accessibility, um, logical structure helps to paint a more clear picture in the user's mind of the, the layout um, and the outline of the document. And to create that logical structure, it's achieved by using navigation elements such as headings, uh, heading levels, which can be used to build a, a table of contents, um, and other things such as li lists and links. So those kinds of elements help kind of create that logical structure that, that uh, we're talking about. Descriptive body copy um, is sometimes overlooked, but that also plays a, an important role in, in, uh, uh, in accessibility. Um, your content really should describe any supporting materials and the content really sets the framework for things such as graphics um, or other visual elements. Um, a descriptive body hop copy um, can help 
keep the alt text for those kinds of uh, visual elements short and to the point. And you also want to make sure that you're providing a pre uh, predictable user experience for, uh, for someone who's consuming the information. Um, so the relationship between headings and paragraphs and figures and page structure, all of that allows um, a screen reader users many different ways to navigate uh, the document reliably and consistently. So establishing those predictable patterns in uh, Word documents or PowerPoint uh, presentations or uh, PDF documents really helps the reader gain more familiarity with the content. Um, as they're circling through uh, uh, the different elements, the accessible elements um, in their pages and uh, the content of those pages as well. So I wanted to start off with an exercise. Uh, this is an example of a syllabi. Um, you know, uh, many of us have uh, seen uh, other syllabi before. Um, this syllabi has all the information that you need to get started with uh, introduction to physics class. So um, I'm actually going to play an example of a screen reader announcing this syllabi. And you can do one of two things. You can close your eyes and you can listen to the screen reader announce the information, um, or you can read along. Um, but then I'm gonna have some questions to ask you after, uh, after this announcement. So here we go. Recording started. Syllabus. Introduction to Physics course syllabus textbook. Our sole text for this course will be Introduction to Physics, second edition, authored by the instructor. Course objectives to offer students exposure to basic principles of physics to provide students with rich, thought-provoking discussions during lecture sessions to provide students with experiential learning opportunities during laboratory sessions. Class schedule week topic reading assignment one course introduction chapter one two inertia equilibrium kinematics chapters two dash three three Newton laws, vectors, momentum, energy, chapters 4-74, matter, elasticity, scaling, chapters 8-105, wave, kinematics, sound, electricity, magnetism, induction, chapter 11-156, light, reflection and refraction, emission, chapters 15-187, review, final exam, grades, grades will be assigned on the 10-point scale, left parent 90 to 100 is an A, 80 to 89 is a B, etc., right parent. Homework exams and projects will be weighted as follows: colon homework exams projects one two final one two final fifteen percent fifteen percent fifteen percent twenty percent ten percent ten percent fifteen percent C program S A Gilman disponible and Francis Sir Demon. Okay, um, so that was a that was the recording. Sorry, um, I did not realize how quiet that recording was. So, um, if you weren't able to to listen to it or to hear it, you can read it. It's up on the, the screen here. So it's essentially the exact same um, announcing um, announcement of the text that is on the screen here. So with that, I, I do have a question for you and I'm gonna need uh, your help, Anna-Marie, because I'm not able to see any of the, the chat responses in this view. So my question to you is uh, how many course exam or uh, how many course objectives rather are there for this introduction to physics course? Any guesses? I'm sorry, Gabby, could you repeat that? Yeah, the question is how many course objectives are there? We have question marks, um, a couple answers of seven. Okay. Um, six, three, Seven, couple more threes, okay. two. All right, that's a that's a pretty good sample there. So, uh, we got some folks um, taking a stab at it. Uh, two, three objectives. Some people say seven objectives. So, my next question to you is, what would be helpful? Because um, we have so many different uh, responses. We don't have consensus on how many objectives are, are, are uh, included for this syllabi. So my question, my next question is, what would be needed in order to make this syllabi more usable to you to help you understand how many course objectives there are? So any guesses there? We have structured, numbered list, structure, 
The document isn't formatted in, a, in an easy way to read. Using list and bullet points help. Headings and numbered bullet points. Bullets or numbers. Um, right. Sections, chart, punctuation, and structure. Excellent. All right. That's, that's a lot great. Of structure Thank you. Going on. Yeah, excellent. So that's exactly what I wanted to hear. So what's missing for this particular syllabi is structure. Um, so the next slide is actually going to show the show you the exact same syllabi. Text is exactly the same, but in this situation, we have a lot more structure here. You can see that we have different headings um, that are a different color and bolded. Um, we do have bullet points in this uh, particular exercise uh, on this particular um, syllabi. We have some tables as well. And visually, we can actually have a better idea of, um, of what is uh, expected of us um, with this structured course syllabi. So I also, I also have a uh, recording of the screen reader announcing this document as well with the additional structure. Hopefully it's a little bit louder than the previous um, recording, but it, it might not be. But I want you to, to listen more closely this time and see if you can tell a difference between the previous recording and this recording. So um, specifically what you're going to be listening for are some more structural elements that, that kind of frame uh, the content of this, uh, this syllabi. So here we go with playing that. Recording started. Stop recording button to act. Syllabus underline accessible dot docs dash word. Sil image. Heading level one introduction to physics course syllabus. Heading level two textbook. Our sole text for this course will be link introduction to physics. Second edition authored by the instructor. Heading level two course objectives. Level one. Bullet to offer students exposure to basic principles of physics. Bullet to provide students with rich, thought-provoking discussions during laboratory sessions. Bullet to provide students with experiential learning opportunities during laboratory sessions. Shape class schedule heading level 2. Week topic reading assignment 1. Course introduction chapter 1. Two, inertia, equilibrium, kinematics, chapters 2-3, 3, Newton's laws, vectors, momentum, energy, chapters 4-7, 4, 4, matter, elasticity, scaling, chapters 8-1, 5, wave, kinematics, sound, electricity, magnetism, induction, chapters 1-1-1-5, 6, light, reflection and refraction, emission, chapters 1-5-1-8, 7, review, final exam, out of table, heading level 2 grades, grades will be assigned on the 10 dash point scale left parent 90 to 100 is an A, 80 to 89 is a B, etc. Right parent. Homework, exams, and projects will be weighted as follows colon, table 2, non uniform table. Homework, exams, projects 1, 2, final 1, 2, final 15%, 15%, 15%, 20%. All right, so uh, with that, with that example, we could actually hear things, we can hear the structure being announced before some of the content was actually announced. So you could hear things such as heading level one before introduction to physics course syllabus was announced. Heading level two before textbook, course objectives, class schedule, grades were announced. Um, you'll also notice that for the course objectives, those bulleted items, um, those were also announced. The bullets were announced uh, for those bulleted items. Um, also in table, the table structure for the simple table um, under class schedule, uh, that's pretty easy for screen readers to kind of navigate because they're, um, you know, there's, it's, it, there's a, it's a very relational table, you know, with three columns and eight rows. Um, but when it came to the more complex table underneath the grade section, I think it announced something like malform table or something like that. So it gives the user a little bit more information about, um, about those kinds of structural elements as well. So a lot of information, a lot more information is included in a, in a well-structured document um, for screen reader applications. So with that, I wanted to talk about best practices for creating Word files, Word documents. Um, but before we get into that, it's important to note that Microsoft Word is a word processing program. It's not a layout program. 
we do have uh, a question. Is... Yeah, sure, go ahead. Regarding the last thing. So on the table, wouldn't adding week before the number, like week one, instead of having it just as a header? You could do that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but uh, having week as the header would also is also uh, acceptable. If you included week within each one of those um, cells, it could be a bit redundant, um, especially if you're going to export that document to a PDF. Um, how a screen reader announces PDF information of a table is a little bit different than how it announces a word table. So if you included the word week in front of each one of those uh, numerical weeks, then it would duplicate that, um, that word um, when reading the table in PDF format. So, uh, so you want to be consistent when you're creating the structure within your document. So really good question there. Yeah. So anyway, let's go back to the practices uh, for Word files. I mentioned that Microsoft Word it's a word uh, processing program. It's not a layout program, but people use uh, Microsoft Word to create, um, you know, long form documents that have a lot of layout um, kind of um, elements to them. And it is possible to create a Word document that has that nice layout, providing you're using the appropriate formatting tools. Um, you want to make sure that you're using headings and defined paragraph styles. And this is allows screen reader users to navigate from section to section or heading to heading rather than having to listen to the entire content from the top of the page to the bottom, like we did in the first exercise with no structure. Um, and it's really important to use headings that create that scaffolding um, to create an outline of the content um, rather than making the text bigger and bolder. That doesn't make a heading, it just makes it bigger and bolder. When you're using the, the heading styles or the paragraph styles, those provide anchor points for screen readers to navigate by. Um, and when you're using those kinds of headings, this can also be really useful for, uh, for longer documents. You can um, initiate the table of contents builder in the review tab and it will take all of those headings and it will create a nicely organized uh, table of contents um, based on the heading structure. Um, so that's uh, an additional navigation aid that's going to uh, uh, benefit all, you, all users, not just screen reader users. Um, alt text provides uh, textual information to visual elements such as images, charts, and graphs. And alt text really should be a brief description of the image and why that image is relevant um, to, to the content. Um, alt text should be short, about 140 characters or so, and that's just enough text to communicate the idea without burdening the user with too much detail that can kind of bog, uh, bog you down there a little bit. And simple images such as photos and logos should have alt text, as should um, more complex images such as charts and graphs. But images that are uh, just decorative or provide no additional information should be marked as de uh, decorative. And it's pretty simple to do that in most Office applications um, to add the alt text just by selecting the image and then um, opening the alt text pane from the picture format tab. And I'll show you a demonstration of that in a little bit. Lists um, are another way of creating structure in documents. Um, you want to make sure that you're using the proper list generating tool to do that. Um, there are tools to create bulleted lists and tools to create numbered lists. And there's also a multi-level list tool. And that helps with creating nested lists um, with varying degrees and can also include uh, numbers and bullets. So talking a little bit more about tables, uh, those are useful for communicating relationships between data especially when those relationships can be expressed in uh, a matrix of rows and columns. So I mentioned that screen readers use table headers to announce the column and row information, and that's particularly true in, in PDF format. And that makes it a lot easier for users to understand the data's organization and relationships. So if heading cells aren't associated with those data cells, then the table is not formatted correctly. And we, um, we did hear an example of that um, with the, uh, the more uh, 
malformed table. We heard that the screen reader actually announced it as a non-conforming table. And if you have one of those, it's uh, with a lot of data, um, a user can quickly get lost and not really understand the relationship of the header and the data information if you have a more complex table. So we really um, do encourage you if you have complex tables to break them down into maybe a series of smaller, more manageable tables. Um, and headers and tables contribute to the semantic structure and data integrity of a document. And they convey the relationship between different parts of the table, such as the column and row headers, and making sure that the content is presented um, in, the, in a more meaningful way. Um, meaningful hyperlinks in electronic uh, or digital documents make it a little bit more easier for screen reader users to determine what that link is all about before they decide to click on it. Um, so rather than listing a URL that starts off with HTTP colon slash slash, blah, 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 usually a string of, of letters and maybe, you know, characters that aren't related, um, using more meaningful hyperlinks um, or actual text to create that link helps the users to understand a little bit something about the, destin of the uh, destination of the link before they uh, decide to click on it. Now, screen reader users, so they sometimes navigate documents using the tab key, um, and that allows them to jump between links or buttons or other interactive elements in a, in a Word document or a PDF document. And they can also generate a list of links and navigate them in order on the page, or they can sort them al alphabetically, wow. um, so they have options there. When they land on a link, the screen reader will announce link and then it will read the link text. And we actually um, experienced that during the second exercise. So you wanna avoid using ambiguous text such as link or click here, um, as that can be re become really redundant and meaningless if it doesn't have the proper context. Including metadata such as document properties, title, author, keywords, those things allow screen reader users to get a little bit more information about the document um, without the need to, opening, uh, to open it because it can take a little bit longer. Or if they have multiple documents that are open, they can access the metadata and determine which, um, which document there actually ha has focus. Um, so adding document titles and keywords is also really helpful for searching and indexing if you're going to place those documents up on a web page. Um, that extra information will also be um, utilized during the search, uh, search um, features. Um, it's also important to include the accurate language assignment if you have uh, documents that are not authored in English or have multiple la languages uh, included in that document. Um, so you can specify a block of text in, an, uh, in another language, as many screen reader applications. They do support multiple languages and can switch on the fly between them um, instantaneously. And we, rec uh, we uh, also experienced that as well during the, the, second, um, uh, the second example. There was a line of French there that was actually announced with the proper French pronunciation. Okay. So those are just your basic top... What is that? Top six uh, tips for creating um, Word files. And so I actually wanted to go ahead and uh, do a demonstration on uh, adding some of these or looking a little bit more deeply at some of these um, um, elements that we talked about. All right. So I have, uh, hopefully you can still see this. This is a, a Word document. This is an example of that uh, syllabi that we were listening to being read out loud by a screen reader. And one of the items, uh, one of the things that I mentioned is to make sure that you are using the proper uh, heading from the styles pane. So I'm actually demonstrating um, Microsoft Word for, um, for Mac desktop. There's also a little bit difference between uh, Microsoft Word for Windows. Um, and then you can also access your documents using OneDrive, so, so uh, Microsoft Online. So um, all of these uh, tips are going to be similar um, in all three of those different applications. Um, but again, you wanna make sure that you're using the most current version. If you're using older version, the location of some of these tools may be different. Um, and the, um, uh, 
uh, they may not work as consistently um, as, as I'm showing you during, uh, during this demonstration. So here's the styles uh, panel. And I can actually extend that by selecting this icon in the, the home ribbon called the styles pane icon. If I click on that, you'll notice that I get the styles pane that pops out on the right hand side here. So um, I have a bunch of different styles that are included, not all of the styles in, the, in this particular template, but ones that are being used right now. Um, so I can place my cursor anywhere in the document and it will, um, you know, it will tell me up here in the ribbon what that heading or what that style is. And so this is a heading level one. I can also see it here in the styles pane. Um, and if I, if for some reason I, I, I wanted to change this particular style, actually, I'm going to, I'm going to choose this heading level two here. Um, if I didn't like the look of that, or if I wanted to brand it, I can actually modify that style and it's going to change globally in the entire document. So I can do that by, um, by looking at the styles pane and selecting this drop down here and select modify style and I get a modify style pane. Or I can right click um, in this ribbon here and select modify from there as well. And I get the modify styles pane. So this is where I can make my changes to, let's say I can change the text to something different. Let's choose. Helvetica, let's make it a little bit bigger. And I don't want that blue color. Let's make it, um, let's make it purple. What else do I want to do? I can probably, um, I, if I wanted to, I could center it. Um, and uh, so this is going to change all heading level two styles within this document. So when I click OK, you'll notice that all my heading twos have updated. So it's a really quick way to make global changes uh, to a document. I'm going to undo that because I don't want it to stick. Okay, um, so that's using the styles pane. Um, I also wanted to, to show you the alt text panel. Um, and to do that, to get to the alt text panel, there's a couple of different ways. You can click on the image. And when you do that, you're going to get a picture format tab that appears here. Um, and I can select that. And from, from this ribbon, I can select the alt text panel, or I can right click on the image and from the context menu, I can select view alt text and that's gonna do the same thing. It's gonna pop out this alt text panel here. So on this alt text panel, you'll notice there's a, um, a, a text field where I'm gonna include my alt text here. And this is a, a logo for Accessible University. So that is acceptable alt text for this particular image. Um, there's also a button here that says mark as decorative. So I mentioned earlier that if you do include decorative images in your document that uh, it, you must mark them as decorative. So that will um, notify to the screen reader that it's just a decorative image and it will ignore it, skip it and move on to the next element. There's also a button here in Office 365 that says generate alt text for me. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and, and press this button and see what kind of results I get here. So it's thinking, and it says a close up of a logo, description automatically generated. So um, it does a pretty good job of, of you know, really basic uh, alt text, but it also gives you this disclaimer here that this uh, description was automatically generated. So. Um, and I have noticed uh, th this is kind of a, a newish feature that, that to automatically generate button, kind of a newish feature in Office 365. And I've noticed that um, over the last year or so, it's gotten a little bit better at, um, uh, you know, kind of making up the, the alt text. And it is based, it, it does use artificial intelligence to, to create those, um, that alt text. And it's getting better. So I think the more we utilize that, I think the better it's going to get. But for now, I'm just going to, oh, I can't undo. So I'm going to go rename that Accessible University. There, OK. Um, we talked about uh, utilizing lists to create structure as well. So we do have uh, a three bullet pointed list here. Um, and uh, you want to use the proper list generating tools to do that. So we've got our bullet library here. We've got our number library right next to it. And then at the very end of that, 
uh, of those options, we have the multi-level list tool. And this is what you would use to create more um, nested lists or lists within lists. Um, and uh, there are uh, several different options here, but if you select define new multi-level lists, this is where you can, um, you know, kind of choose how you, you, how you want to um, format your multi-level lists. Um, so it, it gets a little bit squirrely, but once you get into there and, and figure out how to use it, it's, it's, pretty, um, it's pretty good at creating those, those, uh, those types of lists. Okay, for tables, um, I mentioned making sure to include a table header um, for simple tables. So we've got our simple table here. And I can check to see if this, uh, uh, this table has a header assigned to it by selecting the entire table. And doing that gives me a couple of different more, uh, a couple more options rather here on the, the home room. And I have a, a table design tab and a layout tab that now appear. So if I select the table design tab, I can look here in the upper right hand corner, I've got these check boxes that are checked. And this is the default. When you add a table into your document, um, you're gonna get this as the default. It's always gonna check the header row as a uh, uh, check box uh, that's gonna be checked and that's going to automatically make that top row your header row. Um, you can select banded rows and that gives you the, the different coloring between the, the rows there. Um, and first column also is more of a branding feature as well. Um, and that, uh, that also just um, includes more, um, more colors in, in how you're, you're um, uh, in the different rows and, and columns of your table there. You can leave them um, or you can uncheck them um, uh, however you want to. Um, I leave them checked because I do like to have the, the visual demarcation between those rows and columns. Um, another thing to check is if you are having a table that spans multiple pages, you want to make sure that that header appears at the top of each one of those pages. And to do that, you would go to the Layout tab. And from the Layout tab, from the ribbon there, you would select Properties, and that's going to open up your prop Table Properties dialog. Go to the Row tab. And you want to select the option that says Allow Row to Break Across Pages. So I want to select that. Um, and that's going to include that uh, header row at the top of each one of those pages if you have a, a, a table that's going to span multiple pages. On the alt text um, uh, tab there, you can also include a table summary in the description field. Um, I would not include anything in the title field. I don't think that um, that's going to enhance the table at all, but if you include a table summary in the description tab, such as this is a simple table with three columns, I'm sorry, three, uh, yeah, three columns and eight rows. That gives a little bit more information to the screen reader user and then that information will be announced as well. Okay. Um, so I also talked about including metadata. Um, so we, down here we have some French language that's included in this document here. Um, and we can make sure that that French language is actually uh, assigned accurately by highlighting it. And then uh, going to the review tab um, and then selecting language from the ribbon there. I've got a bunch of different languages that we can assign to, um, to Word documents. And in this case, it is assigned as French. And this checkbox here for detect language automatically, that's uh, by default. So. Um, so in many cases, if you just have one or two lines of, of text that are in a different language, it may pick it up by default, but I wouldn't count on it. So you definitely want to make sure that you are um, assigning the, those language attributes accurately. And then for including a document title um, for Word for Mac, the steps are to go to uh, the Home tab. Oops. Uh, actually to go to the file menu, my mistake, go to the file menu and then select properties. And then from there you would select summary. And this is where you can include that, that title, author, uh, keywords and additional comments. For Word for Windows, it's a uh, different steps. You would go to um, file and then info. Um, and then you would see the, the document properties from there. And it looks a little bit different than, than what we're seeing on the screen right now. Okay. So 
So let's get back to our presentation. And I wanted to bring up some, some barriers that I see um, that relate to accessible content that I still see some authors um, using um, when remediating documents. So Microsoft Office has specifically Word has been around for quite some time, uh, a couple, couple or a few decades, um, I think. And some folks have developed some workarounds for laying out content rather than using the proper formatting tools. And sometimes these workarounds cause, can cause barriers to accessible um, electronic documents. So I wanted to point out a few common barriers, excuse me, um, that crop up um, and that really should be uh, avoided. So uh, first, uh, first up is uh, text boxes in Word. Sometimes authors use text boxes as a way to call out or emphasize a thought. Um, and screen readers read and navigate information in an electronic document in a linear manner. So if a text box is inserted into a document, let's say in the margin or in the middle of a, of a page or something like that, a screen reader might miss that text box. Um, or if it does pick it up, if it does catch it, it may be out of the normal reading order and that may cause confusion. Um, so really the solution is to not use text boxes in Word. Um, I think that that was a feature that was um, added and because somebody wanted it to be there and now people are using it now Microsoft can't take it out of there because people use it, but it really is kind of a barrier to accessibility. Um, I still see some document creators using tabs and spaces to format text to make it look like columns, and this causes very unpredictable results when using a screen reader. Um, it doesn't flow like a column. It will read a line from column one, then a line from column two, then back to column one, then back to column two. So it's really important to use um, the, the columns if you want to reflow that information into that, uh, into that kind of a style. Non-printing characters like hard carriage returns and spaces and tabs, um, those are also announced by screen readers. And so you don't wanna use that as a way to bump information. Um, you actually want to you know, use your, um, um, uh, use the formatting to actually um, indent, uh, indent your, your uh, information however you want it to look. So um, instead of using hard carriage returns, um, you can use paragraph spacing um, to, to increase the, the space between your lines. Um, and instead of using, um, you know, hard carriage returns to, to break it to the next page, you want to use the page break feature um, instead. Um, because if there are multiple carriage returns, um, the screen reader will announce blank, 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 blank. And that's really annoying. And, and some screen readers, users will just stop listening after that because they think that's the end of the, the document. There's nothing else. Um, so it's really important to keep in mind that the more formatting that's included in a Word document, it's going to make creating, a, a, creating an accessible document a little bit more challenging. So you want to keep it simple. Okay, so let's switch gears here and talk about best practices for creating accessible PowerPoint presentations. An important part of making accessible slide decks is to use uh, layout templates that are built into PowerPoint. And this is important because screen readers may jump over or ignore items like text boxes that were added um, from slides that exist outside of the, the content that's provided. So you want to choose the template, uh, template from the proper layout for your slide content and really avoid selecting a blank slide and then adding uh, the text boxes to populate the information. Uh, you want to make sure that you're using uh, 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 titles uh, for your slides. So titles really act as the headings um, in, a, uh, in a PowerPoint presentation. And you want to make sure that um, each slide, all, slide title is unique. If you have duplicate slide titles, you probably want to number them. If you have spill on, you know, spillover information, so uh, you could number them like slide one of two and two of two. Um, let's see, uh, adding alt text in PowerPoint is very similar to uh, what, we, what uh, we saw in Microsoft Word. But if you have multiple images on a PowerPoint slide, 
it, uh, it may save you some time to group those images as one and then add uh, alt text to that group image rather than each one of those single images. Um, if you group an image, it kind of flattens it. And um, the screen reader does recognize that as a group of and it images and will read the alt text, alt text of that group. Um, reviewing the order of slide contents is perhaps the single most important step in making slide decks accessible. Screen readers and other assistive technologies read the slide content in the order that it was added to the slide. So this makes it really important to check the reading order of your slides. As you know, sometimes authors um, take old uh, slide um, projects and then create new ones by you know pulling slides from this presentation and that presentation, and then they're going to add something here and something there. So by the time you put it all together, you might not know what the reading order is. So it's really critical to um, to look at that. Okay, uh, giving an accessible presentation. It's important to keep in mind that the presentation conveys information from a speaker to an audience, and that's supported by these kinds of visual materials. Um, so you want to keep the content simple. The slides are not the presentation. Uh, the presentation. The person is the is the presenter. The presentation. The slides should complement um, the the information that you are announcing. You want to make sure that the, uh, the text and important visuals are big enough to read from either the back of the room if you're giving a presentation in person um, or if you're um, giving a, a, a Zoom presentation on small screens, you want to make sure that that text is big enough to, re uh, to read. And you also want to verbally describe the content uh, of the slides um, as well. You, you probably want to assume that some participants are unable to see it. Sometimes uh, people join, um, um, you know, a Zoom presentation as they're going on a walk or as they're driving somewhere. So you, you can't assume that everyone can see your presentation as well. And most importantly, you want to give people time to process the information. A lot of times we're talking about some really high concept things. And so you want to give them time to, uh, to digest that information before talking about another really important point. Okay, with that, I'm going to pause here and see if there are any questions before going on to the demo. Hey, B, this is Andrea. And um, there was a question in chat. Um, when you're talking about going into metadata and adding a title, and is that different than naming your document? And I took a stab at responding, and so I'd like you to double check my work that adding the title in the properties or the metadata is different than naming the document. So the title could be general accessibility document, but the document name might be accessdoc.docx. Right. Yeah. No, that's actually, that's accurate, Andrea. So, um, so there is in the styles um, pane, there, there is a, a title style. And if you utilize that title style, that does not, um, that's not the same as going into the properties of the document and, and adding the, the title in there. It's just a style. Uh, in the in the uh, in the the um, uh, the uh, styles panel itself, it doesn't um, uh, automatically populate the metadata. In fact, if you um, use uh, title as a style, it just maps as a paragraph. It doesn't map as anything else. So um, that's why it's really important to actually go into the document properties properties itself and change the document title in there instead of using the title style from the styles pane. So hopefully that clears that up a little bit more. Okay. So I'm gonna move on to demonstration of you PowerPoint. have another question. Oh, okay, let's go ahead with the other question. Any thoughts on animations in PowerPoint where accessibility is concerned? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, many animations can be detrimental for those folks that have um, a seizure disorder. So, um, so use them sparingly. We actually don't recommend that you use them at all. 
Um, but you may see some of us in some of our presentations that have animations. Um, they can be really kind of challenging for screen reader users too. If they're consuming a PowerPoint presentation in presentation mode, and there are animations in there, it's really difficult for the, the screen reader to understand what's happening during those animations. So we don't recommend using them. So great questions. Okay, uh, so uh, back to PowerPoint presentations. I wanted to show you, um, oops, that's not the right one. Here we go. I wanted to show you, that's not the right one either. Uh, here we go. We have a UW branding um, where, that has templates that you can use. Um, and uh, Anne-Marie, can you put that uh, link in the, the chat there? So this is from uh, U UMAC, uh, University Marketing and Communications, and they have uh, accessible PowerPoint presentations. And so um, I actually worked on these, so they, they should be accessible with one caveat. I forgot to check the color contrast between link text and the background. So there might be one area that uh, you may need to address if you are using these PowerPoint templates, the color contrast for those links. But um, other than that, the layout for these, um, these templates are accessible so you can download them and use them. Um, let's see where to go, here it goes. Otherwise, if you're using just the, the generic, um, you know, PowerPoint application on your, your desktop, you can use the built-in layouts. And I'm gonna pop this layout panel out because this is really important. You can see here that the, the different layouts actually have titles here. So this is for your slide title, file and, title and content, uh, section header to content, comparison, title only, content with caption, picture with caption. Notice that I, I skipped over the one that says blank and you should too, don't use that one because there's no formatting using those, those blank, um, those blank uh, layout templates. Um, uh, make sure that you're choosing the, the correct layout um, that corresponds with the content that you wanna share. Okay, so grouping images, I'm gonna show you really quickly how to group images. I can select each one of these images into uh, uh, all together. So I just pressed shift click. And so all three of these images are selected. Then I can go to the arrange drop down menu from the home ribbon and select group. And from here, I can add alt text to the entire group. Um, and the screen reader will, will recognize that. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to show you, I'm gonna, I'm gonna undo that. The other thing that I wanted to show you is how to check the reading order. Um, and in order to do that, back, back on the home ribbon, you would go back to the Arrange tab and select the Selection pane. And the Selection pane works across all applications, Mac, Windows, Desktop, and online version. Um, and the Selection pane um, presents the elements of a slide deck in reverse order. So it's kind of similar if you were using um, uh, Photoshop and you have layers, those layers are in reverse order. So it's the same thing um, uh, in PowerPoint as well. And I can just click on each one of these elements and, and you can see that they're highlighted um, in the, the main window as, uh, as they appear. So, um, and I can just move these things around if they're out of order. Uh, so I can just, really easily move them out of um, back into the proper order. And then I can check the reading order by going um, uh, from the bottom and then arrowing up. So really, really quick way to, 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 to check that. Okay, let's go back to our presentation. Uh, what makes a PDF accessible? Well, for a PDF to be considered accessible, it must have tags. And those tags must be uh, semantically correct and in a logical reading order. Essentially tags are XML based coding inside of the PDF document and that provides structure and necessary semantic information um, that allows screen reader users to navigate a document successfully. So if a document is not tagged, Acrobat will infer uh, structure based on the reading order preference setting 
And that results in text being read probably in the wrong order, or sometimes not at all. Um, let's see here. Uh, PDF does support complex tables uh, that have merged or split cells. Um, but in order to do that, uh, in order to make those complex tables understandable, you have to give each table cell an ID so that you can specify which headers go with which uh, data cells. And tables created in Word or PowerPoint, they won't generate or export IDs when they're converted to PDF. So any tables created in those native formats are going to be, need to be remediated using Adobe Acrobat Pro or another PDF editor to add those, uh, those IDs and to get that relationship. Tagging a table in a PDF editor requires a lot of training and skill uh, to be able to associate headers with that data. So the more complex the table is, the more challenging it's going to be to remediate. Um, similar to Word or PowerPoint, meaningful images must have alt text and decorative images must be marked as such. I'll show you how to do that. Um, PDF forms do have some accessibility limitations compared to web-based forms, such as Google Forms or Microsoft Forms, and we recommend that you use web-based forms um, as a more accessible solution. But the process for creating PDF forms is incredibly daunting for the content creator, and it's also equally daunting for screen reader users to consume that. So when a screen reader user navigates uh, from form field to form field, the contents must be described to the user, and each form control in a PDF needs to be explained using the tooltips. Um, and you want to make sure that the reading order of those uh, uh, form controls is accurate. Um, and at this point, math and STEM content uh, that require scientific notation, they're not supported in PDF. Um, what we recommend instead is MathML or Mathematical Markup Language or Math Type for Word, and those should be used uh, to make sure that math equations and symbols are announced uh, accurately. Okay, so there are three types of PDF documents. The first type is just an image of a PDF and those are, or an image rather of the content. And those are usually created when an article from a book is scanned on a flatbed scanner and the output is uh, selected as PDF. And this type of PDF is totally inaccessible to screen reader as the document is just an image of text without any actual real text there. So on this slide, I have a, an example of a scanned document, and you might notice that you know the it's kind of hard to read in areas, and there's underlining, and e even as uh, you know somebody who just uses glasses, it's very really kind of difficult to read that because there's just a lot of stuff on there. Um, so it is possible to convert an image PDF to selectable or, or machine readable text using optical character recognition. But with all this visual noise on this page, it's gonna cause errors when converting it to text. And that's gonna require a lot of editing during the OCR process. The second type of PDF is one that has text and the text can be selected by a mouse and it's machine readable, but there's no structure. So um, it just announces the text without any context or semantic structure. And structure is what allows screen readers to navigate and jump from section to section and that um, also um, uh, provides reliability and consistent of the, the content as well. The third type of PDF document it was, is one that has selectable text and the text is tagged and has appropriate heading levels, Everyone. list markup Good. and um, other stuff that allows screen readers to, to search a document and consume the information in a more predictable way. Uh, we use Adobe Acrobat to check for accessibility errors and to fix them as well. Um, Acrobat's not really used to create PDF documents. It's not really made for that. It's mostly made to edit PDFs and to remediate PDF documents. Um, but the more accessibility work you do in your native application when you create your document before exporting to PDF, then the less you'll have to use Acrobat to touch up any errors. Um, when to use PDFs, just wanted to remind folks that PDF is really well supported in the Windows environment when it comes to, to navigation and semantics, but Mac users have a very different experience when uh, uh, navigating or, or consuming a tagged PDF. Um, essentially, PDF is not really well supported 
well in the, the Mac OS environment. Um, text to speech is, but navigation is not. Uh, and that's kind of a shortcoming on the Mac side. So whenever possible, we recommend authoring in HTML or distributing the native Office file instead of, instead of PDF as that has uh, far more accessibility formats uh, than PDF. But PDFs are a huge part of digital communication and some users, they like to download and print documents instead of reading information online. Um, and there are a few cases when folks might want to choose to use PDFs over other formats, um, including publishing secure documents that can't be edited. Although Adobe Acrobat Pro is a PDF editor and there are free other free PDF editors out there. So um, that seems to be a popular misconception. But what PDF does do well is it preserves the layout of a document for printing, including images and typeface. And that's really the predominant use for, for PDF. So wanted to do a quick demo um, of PDF and hopefully we'll have enough time to talk about uh, Google. So let me go to my, here's my PDF document here. And I wanted to show you the tag tree. And in order to do that in Acrobat, I'm gonna go to the view menu, show hide navigation panes and accessibility tags. So this is the tag tree. And when I click at the, uh, on the very top there, the document, that highlights all of the information in the tag tree. And I can just arrow down and I can see each particular, each individual element within that tag tree. And I can expand it and I can see the contents in that tag tree as well. So I can see H1, H2, I've got a paragraph with link information there. Um, so really easy to look at the content and also confirm the reading order of information as well. Um, I can also adjust the reading order if things are not in the correct order. I can just click and drag them, which is kind of nice. Um, but beware, if you make any changes in the tag tree, it could have unpredictable uh, results. So if you're not, if you haven't been trained on how to uh, remediate a, a, a tag PDF document, um, just be very cautious about that. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about accessibility of other formats. InDesign is a popular uh, document layout program. Um, and it's a, it is possible to create an InDesign document that exports to a mostly accessible PDF. But there's a very specific workflow that needs to be followed when creating that. Um, and I've actually included a, a link here um, on this slide that talks a little bit more, more about um, that. Uh, um, uh, the steps to get you started in creating accessible InDesign uh, documents and accessible PDF. Um, so we really recommend additional training to learn how to and to practice uh, using the proper workflow for creating accessible InDesign. And we recommend pubcom.com as the vendor. Um, we worked with them before. Um, and if there are any graphic designers or if you know any graphic designers in the audience today that are using InDesign and you're interested in a training from PubCom, please reach out to me. We are sponsoring a training that's coming up in a couple of weeks and we may have a Cedar tool available if you want to clear your calendar for four, uh, for four half days, um, then you can learn that workflow. Google Workspace, um, Google Docs is an online word processor where authors can create documents and Google Slides is used for creating slide decks. Google uses a rich text editor to create that content um, and you wanna use a similar, uh, similar kind of methods uh, such as using headings and, and lists uh, for that. And really quickly, I'm gonna show you, if I can find it show you uh, how that looks. So I've got uh, our syllabus here and uh, this is the rich text editor here. So you can choose the styles drop down, and this is where you're gonna get those, those different types of styles to create your PDF document. Okay, so we are at two o'clock and um, I haven't gotten into, well, on the slide deck, there is a review of some formats and which ones are better to use than others. Again, we recommend that you use HTML for most applications. Um, if you do have digital documents, we recommend using the, the, the native uh, Word or pre PowerPoint presentation to distribute. 
Um, you can use PDFs, but there are some limitations as uh, outlined here in this, uh, in this table. And then here are some additional resources for you as well. A link to our uh, documents page to the branded templates from UMAC. Also included a, a link here for describing figures if you needed help with, uh, with creating alt text. Um, and then if you are creating uh, PDF documents, there is a third party checker called the PAC 2021. Um, and that checks against uh, PDF UA, which is the standard for, for PDF, uh, accessible PDF documents. So that's all I have for you today. Um, my email is gabyd at uw.edu. Um, if you have any additional questions, I kind of rushed it at the end there, so I wasn't able to get to all the information. Uh, but if you do have additional questions or something that I, I didn't uh, cover during this time, or you'd like to help with consulting on making sure that your document or your PowerPoint presentation is accessible, please reach out to me. Thank you.